In 1852, a Canadian inventor named Abraham Gessner discovered how to make kerosene from crude petroleum. In an age when candles and whale oil provided the only light after sundown, it was a dramatic discovery. Borrowing a page from alcohol distillers, Gessner used a primitive still type system to distill and refine crude petroleum by heating it and separating its various elements. One of those elements was kerosene, which he found burned longer and cleaner than whale oil. The superiority of kerosene was not only in the fact that it was a, a better illuminant, but it was ever so much cheaper. Whale oil was getting extremely costly. Town gas, for example, about 1860, you could light your house with town gas for about $10 a month. You could light your house with kerosene for $10 a year. Within a year of Gessner's discovery, his kerosene works was producing 5,000 gallons a day, and the need for more crude petroleum became critical. By 1859, 34 startup companies were producing $5 million worth of kerosene annually. The rush to find oil, and with it, huge fortunes, was on. Among the fortune hunters was a man named George Bissell. Bissell heard that salt miners in western Pennsylvania were complaining that their digs were being contaminated by oil. Smith went to work in a pump house that Drake had bought months before. He began by building a kind of battering ram out of white oak, which was used to pound metal pipe into the ground. The crude method worked for a while, but the human-powered contraption was useless when they hit bedrock 39 feet down. Drake hooked a steam engine to the ram and continued to pound into the earth. For months, they drilled in vain. Then, on August 29, 1859, with the project on the verge of cancellation, Drake came to check on Smith. He found the blacksmith and his sons not drilling, but standing guard at the site. Around them were tubs and barrels filled with oil. Drake had made the most important oil strike in history. He had persistence, he had imagination, uh, he uh, didn't know what couldn't be done. Uh, and uh, uh, so finally, after he got down to about 69 feet, he realized that there was something down there uh, that you could see uh, uh, that was not water, it was not brine, and when it was pumped up, it was petroleum. And uh, so that was really, that was the crucial breakthrough. News of the find quickly spread. Thousands were drawn to the area to make their fortune at a time when oil was selling for $20 a barrel. Almost overnight, a new town sprung up at an oil field near Drake's Well. Appropriately named Pithole City, by September of 1865, the town had 15,000 residents. By the mid-summer of 1865, by July, Pithole had its uh, post office opened up, and by September of 1865, it had its own newspaper. Pithole had over 50 hotels, and the boarding houses, there's too numerous to count. It was uh, impossible to keep track of all the people, but the post office uh, would handle 10,000 letters a day, and a good many of those went to the dead letter office due to the fact that so many people were in and out of Pithole uh, compared with um, your other smaller towns around the area. Pithole was where the, all the excitement was at that period of time of 1865. Then in January of 1866, the wells began to dry up. Output fell from 6,000 barrels a day to 3,000. Within the year, Pithole was producing only 2,000 barrels a day, and by the following fall, the flow had become a mere drip. Fortunes that had been made overnight vanished just as quickly. Within a year, the town was deserted. A parcel of land that had sold for $2 million in 1865 
was auctioned off for $4.37. Edwin Drake, the man responsible for the most important oil strike in history, died penniless in 1880. Still, America was hooked on petroleum and the kerosene lamp. Great wealth awaited any man who could extract, process, and refine oil cheaply and quickly. Just such a man was working as a clerk at a Cleveland produce shipping firm. His name, John Davidson Rockefeller. John Davidson Rockefeller got into the oil business almost as an afterthought. At the age of 19, he and a partner had formed a produce shipping firm in Cleveland, Ohio, specializing in pork, salt, and wheat. During the early years of the Civil War, Rockefeller's produce firm prospered as wartime demands for these staples increased. Already a wealthy man by his late 20s, Rockefeller saw the future one cold fall day in 1863 when a new railroad reached Cleveland. Now Cleveland was linked to the oil-rich regions of Pennsylvania. Dozens of petroleum refineries quickly sprang up along the city's rail lines. Rockefeller knew an opportunity when he saw one. In 1864, he bought his first oil refinery. It did not take him long to realize that the profit potential dwarfed that of the produce business. He became convinced that his future lay in oil, not commodity exchange. Rockefeller's entry in, into oil refining uh, follows, I think, a careful analysis of, of, uh, of the commodity by, by Rockefeller himself. He saw the potential in this. Its lighting capability was much higher than candles or camphene or, or sperm oil. And uh, he probably saw the, the potential. But he also heard what I would call the ruckus coming from the Pennsylvania border. Because by the mid-1860s, Cleveland, Cleveland's newspapers were awash with stories of the fortunes being made and lost in the oil fields near Titusville and in western Pennsylvania. Rockefeller's partner, Maurice Clark, did not share his enthusiasm for the oil industry. The partners reluctantly decided to part ways. The two agreed to bid against each other for the firm's assets, including the refinery. The stakes were high for both men, but Rockefeller's resolve was unwavering. That was the day that determined my career. I felt the bigness of it but I was as calm as I am talking to you now, John Rockefeller. In the end, Clark bid $72,000. Rockefeller bid $72,500. It was a $500 difference that altered the course of history. Immediately upon taking control of the company, Rockefeller focused his energies exclusively on oil. As the Civil War ended and America's economy became more and more industrialized, demand for kerosene grew in the nation's rapidly expanding urban areas. Rockefeller's profits soared. In 1866 alone, sales of Rockefeller kerosene reached $2 million. Despite his success, Rockefeller was not content but his drive to expand his operations was at the mercy of his suppliers, over which he had virtually no control. John D. Rockefeller was concerned about the fluctuating prices in the oil industry. It was a boom-bust industry, and he thought that if he could stabilize the industry, this would not only be good for America, but it would be good for John D. Rockefeller. To Rockefeller, stabilize meant control and the best way to get control was to buy it. He bought his own ships to transport Rockefeller kerosene from Cleveland to the Midwest, tanker cars to transport crude oil to the company's refineries and warehouses in New York. 
He even purchased forest reserves of white oak timber to ensure the company had an adequate supply of barrels. But there was one more thing left to conquer. Rockefeller himself, only a decade after entering the oil business, was one of the richest men in the country, with a personal wealth of several million dollars. He was now both admired and feared by businessmen throughout America. It's interesting to try to figure out how much money he made and how much he uh, accumulated. I think the answer is that at the time, not even Rockefeller knew because the money was literally coming in faster than he could count it. I think comparing a Rockefeller to a Bill Gates is probably a good example uh, because Gates' personal wealth now is in excess of 10 or 15 billion dollars and that's so far beyond what an average American worker makes today. I think very much an average American worker of the 1890s or the turn of the century probably would have seen Rockefeller in the same terms because his wealth was certainly in the hundreds of millions, perhaps even approaching a billion dollars. So way, way ahead, an average American production worker, a factory worker at the turn of the century might be making, depending on his skill level or her skill level, might be making five, ten, twelve dollars a week. So five or six hundred dollars a year was considered a decent living for an average industrial worker in America, comparing that with a, with a fortune worth hundreds of millions. So the gap is similar, and, and I think Americans saw these so-called robber barons as people, in effect, living in a whole other world. I mean, their, their whole standard of living was just, it couldn't even be compared in some ways. The gap was so great. The future growth of Standard Oil seemed limitless. But forces were gathering that would soon threaten the mighty empire and its king. By 1879, after 15 long years of intimidation, force, and strong-arm tactics, the Standard Oil Company controlled an incredible 90% of all refinery operations in the United States. But Rockefeller's overwhelming power caused some Americans to fear that the free enterprise system was in danger. Without competition, there was no force that could check what Standard could do to prices if it so chose. It's looked upon as uh, the monopoly, the, the evil trust, and it's looked upon at this point in what it begins to be known as the American Progressive Era as the antithesis of what America should be. Criticism of Rockefeller reached unprecedented levels. His enemies proclaimed that Standard Oil was legally chartered only in Ohio and that under the laws of the time, the company had no right to own refineries or warehouses in other states. Moving quickly to protect himself, Rockefeller came up with a brilliant plan. In 1882, he organized the Standard Oil Trust. The trust is a legal form of business organization. And in the latter part of the 19th century, it was the mechanism by which monopolies were created. What Rockefeller did with all of his oil companies, he, uh, in a sense, folded them into the standard trust that en ended up owning all of the shares of these companies. Rockefeller could control all of these and operate as a monopoly. With his refining and distribution interests protected by the trust, Rockefeller set his sights on production. A golden opportunity soon presented itself. In the late 1880s, the Pennsylvania oil fields began to dry up. The center of the nation's oil production shifted west to newly discovered sources in Ohio and Indiana. The trust began buying up all the petroleum-rich properties it could get its hands on. By 1891, despite the fact that it had owned virtually no oil fields just a decade before, Standard now produced over 25% of the nation's total output of crude and refined nearly 90%. The nation was totally dependent on kerosene for light, 
and Standard control virtually every drop. It was simple supply and demand, and Rockefeller, for all intents and purposes, was the only supplier. Standard Oil seemed unstoppable. But on November 1st, 1879, the U.S. Patent Office awarded patent number 223898 to Thomas Edison. It was for the electric lamp. Edison found that his lighting system would be so cheap that only the wealthy could afford to burn candles. But of course, it was not the candle makers who had the most reason to be concerned. The light bulb took the country by storm and put the entire oil industry at risk. Thomas Edison was just not an inventor, a scientist. He realized very quickly the commercial uh, interest his invention would create. He priced his electricity to be competitive with oil. By 1892, an oil man, if he could sell a gallon of oil for two cents, he was considered pretty lucky. As the 19th century came to a close, oil men feared for their future. But another invention soon appeared that filled them not with dread, but with hope. Henry Ford's automobile ran on an internal combustion engine powered by gasoline, a derivative of petroleum. About the same uh, time frame that uh, most American homes were beginning to be uh, electrified, uh, the, the horseless carriage came along, the development of the internal combustion engine, and then the mass marketing of those, so that every home could have an automobile, and they were all powered by gasoline. So one door opens when one door closes. <laughs> 